In a series of five videos, we'll talk with five men who will shed their light on the 60-year-old icon that is the Speedmaster, aka the Moonwatch. Today we'll talk to the man who was responsible for testing and certifying a watch from NASA's moon program, James H. Reagan. To us, he's known as the man who's responsible for changing the Speedmaster into the Moonwatch. I'm Jim Reagan. Uh, I worked for NASA for 36 and a half years. Started there at the beginning of the Gemini program and went to about mid-shuttle mid when I finally retired. Uh, I was in charge of uh, the photographic hardware and the crew equipment that the crew used up until the last 10 years when I, when I was subsystem manager of crew accommodations on the shuttle, which was everything inside the vehicle was basically my responsibility. The uh, the crew was always used, because they were test pilots to begin with, were always used to having a wristwatch issued by the government to them. In the Mercury days, they weren't issued a watch. There was not room hardly for the astronauts in the small Mercury capsule. At some point in time, later in the, in the program, there was uh, two Omegas bought by the astronauts themselves, uh, Wally Shira and Gordo Cooper. And they flew those themselves uh, as not issued by the government. So at, at that point, when we got to the Gemini program, the, uh, I was given the assignment to go out and find a crew-worn watch that they could use to use for EVA, for inside the vehicle, and, and all of their functions. Uh, it's, it's just something back then that everybody was used to wearing, the, wearing watches, but they came in to the fact that when I when I interviewed the astronauts and decided what they really or they decided what they really wanted, they also wanted not only time but also being able to to record events in in time as well. So that meant they uh, basically ironed it down to a chronograph function watch. The uh, typical government issue is that I couldn't go out and just buy a watch. I had to put out a specification exactly what we wanted in the watch, all the features that we wanted, and then ask any watch manufacturer to propose a watch that they would like for us to evaluate. I sent it to 10 different manufacturers, as specified by the government, they wanted 10, but it was also advertised in a, what is called a Commerce Business Daily, which anybody could pick it up and, and found that out. In the end, when we got the proposals back, we only got four. It was uh, safety, reliability, and quality people at NASA determined what environments we had to test any piece of hardware, whether it be a watch or a camera or a, anything. And those were very stringent requirements, more like a piece of hardware that was mounted on the spacecraft rather than on an individual wearing to begin with. Uh, they were tough. Every one of those was tough. Uh, all the way from thermal to cold to vibration, shock. There was just a myriad of 10 different uh, requirements that we had. And so each one of the watches were submitted to those with the exception that if it failed and could be restarted, reset the time, uh, then it was a failure and they would be eliminated from the process. In the end, the only watch that made it through all of those 10 environments of testing was the Omega watch. The other two failed on the very first test and they, neither one of them could be started again. All of the environments were, were, were set up, they, we had the test equipment there in Houston to test them. The tough ones were the thermal requirements because they basically was plus or minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which is extremely difficult test for hardware to begin with, especially a watch. Uh, thermal vacuum, uh, where you also had uh, it in a vacuum with heat. Uh, you had shock, vibration. That was an acceptable requirement and Omega passed all of those. It was strictly a business relationship to start with, uh, but they were, became an integral partner with NASA in the, in the timing uh, function. They uh, did everything we ever asked. Uh, they provided, uh, the, the, they were the only ones that I would allow to do the maintenance on the watches. Uh, 
To this day, I believe that Omega is the only contractor to NASA that has been there since the Gemini days to today. They still provide watches uh, to the space program. The, the, the Gemini days, we had the unprotected uh, pushers on the side, and the problem I had with that is we, at least six months before every mission, the, the crew and the backup crew got a set of training watches so they could get familiar with it and use them. And they were always bending the pushers, and they were breaking them off. And so at that point, uh, not knowing exactly what Omega was doing, I suggested to them that I needed help on that and come to find out after the fact a little bit, that they had already been working on that design. So that came up with the next design of the watches that we bought in, in, very, uh, in the very early Apollo days to, to take care of that problem. After that was done, I never bent, or the astronauts never bent another pusher on it. I wanted to start talking about the original uh, Speedmaster that Omega developed, and this is before NASA it was developed. The first generation, which was out of production by the time that we got to the uh, need for them on, on the Gemini days. And the next generation came along, which is a little bit more modern. And uh, this is the first generation of the watch that we tested to, to uh, make sure that it would pass all the tests. And uh, this was the one that was in the Gemini days. You'll see that uh, you can see on the side, you see the pushers were not protected. And these is what I was talking about earlier that uh, would, would get bent up. After I asked them for help, uh, the third generation, which was basically the, the watch that we flew on Apollo, it has now the protection on the pushers, which kept them from getting bent and broken. So we, we made a vast improvement both for NASA and also for the general public in, in particular. Next generation is a, the, the, the radio dial, and this is one that I had to write a specification to go out and buy for the shuttle program. I uh, provided the drawing, specified how I wanted uh, those inside dials to read. They again won the contract to provide this watch. Following that, when we got into the late uh, space shuttle, uh, on their own, uh, Omega developed a, uh, what we call the original first X-33. Uh, NASA decided they wanted to fly this one, and so they uh, provided NASA with 25 originally as almost a prototype, which the crew used, got familiar with, made any comments, and then NASA had to turn these back in, and then they bought a, a, quite a series of these. Several years later, uh, the X-33 Skywalker, which is now a standard equipment by ESA and the Russians, uh, is now the one that is out there uh, being used. NASA still continues to use the first generation they bought. I love the watches because I never had trouble with the watches. <laughs> they continued to work. Omega serviced them for me. I wouldn't let anybody but Omega touch the watches, even to service those things. I got all the pieces they took out if they changed them back. I never had trouble with, with watches. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for man.